Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 619, not 219, 619 of the Agostino Zynga show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. I hope you are doing well wherever this lovely podcast may find you today. I hope you are doing well. How am I? Doing pretty good, all things considered. I just watched Man United beat Fulham away from home 2-1 away day victories always feel sweet especially when they're in London my hometown it's nice to see us play and absolutely um, you know win especially when it comes to last minute winners against a tough side like Fulham promoted from the championship last season and have basically held their own pretty well in the Premier League they're not like um, some of these other clubs that come up in the championship who really really struggle to get to grips with the pace with the quality they've kind of really done well even though they've signed a few players obviously but they've done well in terms of playing the way they want to play um you know enforcing their style onto the pitch having a very competitive and hungry players and clearly making most games very competitive regardless of who they're playing and the game today against united was no exception we started off the first half a little bit shaky i think for the most part obviously the situation we've got at the moment now with no real deputy right back to replace dalo who was suspended so we had to play malasia there who's left footed on the right hand side just didn't really work and then we had Shaw playing at left back who's not the most adventurous so we ended up with two fullbacks who were more focused on making sure they didn't make a mistake defensively as opposed to attacking which didn't help us going forward and then Martial was also a bit off form so he wasn't the sharpest or he didn't really look like he was on the ball Rashford of course is pretty much useless when it comes to playing up front or in that kind of forward position especially if he's not running onto the ball and the midfield was a little bit shaky also I wasn't really too happy with Bruno Fernandes' performance but that aside we still managed to sneak a goal Christian Eriksen scores a, a decent goal. Obviously, it wasn't intended because Bruno was aiming for the goal, but he still was following the ball into the box and ended up clipping the ball in to get his first goal for the club. Um, Fulham ended up equalising just after the half-time. Our old ex-player it came back to haunt us, Daniel James. He came on and actually affected the game really well. And shout-out to Daniel James also. I was never really a fan of him at United. I thought he was pretty basic and pretty horrible. And the thing about our players that we sign is it's not always about the fact that I would hate a player because of them. It's usually what they represented. At the time, I thought us going out to sign a player like Daniel James from Swansea, um, given his limited football ability, in my opinion, and his, you know, but his high athleticism and the fact that he can run really fast, I thought was a bad omen and kind of signaled just where, we, where United were, where we were prioritizing signing players like that who we could maybe, you know, I extract more money from if we decided to sell him, sell him, which we did. We ended up selling him for a profit. And just a player that didn't necessarily feel like he was going to push us to get a position of winning the league anytime soon or, you know, challenging for European Cups, whether it's Europe, Europa or Champions League. But him as a guy, um, I'm really happy to see that he's been able to kind of use the time that he's been at United and the clout to kind of use that to obviously go to a club like Leeds where he'd done pretty well, I thought. Um, and then I think he's on loan now at Fulham, if I'm not mistaken. And he came on there and did pretty well, so he wanted to perform. And of course, Andreas Pereira did well for them also. Another player who I didn't really rate that well, but he's definitely turned into being a vital player for Fulham. The Daniel James scores, fair enough for him. And then the, the half felt like it was kind of petering out a bit. It felt like Fulham were taking more control of the game. But then we ended up making some decent substitution, one of them being Alejandro Garnacho. He ends up coming on the half Argentinian, half Spanish player who I think, I'm pretty sure, represents Argentina. He comes on and he's a young player, kind of player from our academy, a player who has got a lot of good hopes for, or high hopes for, sorry, and he definitely lit the game on fire. And the thing I like about Alejandro Garnacho and something that he did before he scored the winning goal to help us win 2-1 is that for the most part, he feels like a throwback. That's what he is. He's like a throwback winger where wingers before in football used to just be as wide as possible. They used to love enjoying, they used to really enjoy getting the ball on the touchline and then running at their defender. And it didn't really matter if they were fast or not. Some of my most favourite wingers in the world, like, you know, Joaquin Sanchez, the Robertis legend and Luis Figo, right? He, they, these guys, you wouldn't describe them as like having incredible acceleration or incredible pace. But what they were was just really aggressive. They ran towards their defenders they really kind of you know um gave them a torrid time and made them feel nervous and put the fear of god in every time they touched the ball because you know they're going to keep attacking you attacking you attacking you and that's all it necessarily took to kind of be an effective winger back then but nowadays maybe because of the athleticism in general and the pace of the league people kind of want 
wingers to be like Gareth Bale speed, right? And which you're never going to always get. Sometimes you will get them, but it doesn't mean you're going to get football ability. But what I like about Garnacho, obviously he's got the speed and acceleration, but I do like the fact that he's just aggressive. He's really aggressive. Like he always attacks the defenders. And I think this goal is a good example of it because I don't think the defender should have let Garnacho go past him the way he did in that one two. I think it was probably a, an easier position to defend than what it looked like. But I think the times that Garnacho came on beforehand and the things that he did prior put the fear of God in the defender and they were worried. So they were more worried about where Garnacho was going to go as opposed to just defending the space. And that obviously led to the goal. But the goal itself was beautiful, very well, very well constructed. He passes the ball into Ericsson. I think just outside the area actually and then Ericsson one touch uh, passes it inside the box Garnacho runs onto it and ends up basically running weirdly enough he didn't run on the outside ran on the inside of the defender which is very bizarre you don't really see that too often and it would end up be able to left foot finish it in the bottom corner absolutely brilliant finish I thought the celebration was a little bit cringe the messy celebration that he did holding up his shirt for everyone to see the number it's a little bit big timey a little bit cringe but I do like the fact that he's a young player and clearly has a lot of ambition a lot of hunger a lot of drive and he's willing and ready to make a name for itself at his club and you can never begrudge that sort of thing so that's clear and happy to see but the thing to come out of this which is the main thing that's been driving social media crazy over the last couple of hours especially on united twitter has been ronaldo's interview with piers morgan yeah you heard that right ronaldo sat down with piers morgan for a tell all interview where he basically um trashed the club trashed the manager um and just basically went in on us overall and it's really divided the fan base for the most part it's really 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 been a divisive interview for me just like without kind of going into the quotes and just kind of talking about it overall I am somebody that can sit in the middle and see both sides I can see from Ronaldo's side of things how he could walk into a club like United and think to himself this club has no position given their recent lack of success and given who's currently playing at the club and given their current standing they are in no position whatsoever to bench me given what I've achieved in the game if you're just looking at it from a purely selfish Ronaldo is the only thing that matters in the world kind of view but I can also understand it from the point of view of the club wanting to extract as much value as they want as they can out of a player like Ronaldo because if you're going to sign someone like Ronaldo on those inflated wages you have to make sure that you can extract as much value as you can from him as a brand as an entity as a commodity I know it's taking away his humanity but that's how you can look at it as a club as a manager when he comes into Eric Ten Hag you're in a bit of a weird position Ronaldo's probably well more well known than you are he obviously is somebody that's probably won more than you have as a coach. I definitely think he has. And he's clearly somebody you have to handle differently when it comes to player power and when it comes to having a grip on the dressing room. Because you hear that a lot with managers and coaches. They always say, if you lose a grip on the dressing room, it's basically over before you started. You have to make sure everyone knows who's in charge. But you also don't want to upset a player like Ronaldo because you could use his leadership, use his influence um, to actually help and aid you in terms of getting that dressing room on side. So I can see both all sides. And also just in terms of a player point of view, if you're Eric Ten Hag and you play football a certain way, you might look at Ronaldo and think he doesn't suit the style of football that I like to play, but I can utilize him here and there when needs be. But obviously a player like Ronaldo doesn't necessarily take kindly to being played as um, a sort of backup player or utilised here and there. He wants to play every single match, all game, um, regardless. It doesn't matter if he's hopping on one leg, if he has one leg, he wants to play every single minute of every single game. And if he doesn't, he's going to throw his toys out of the pram or he's going to storm out and go home as he's previously done. So I get every side of it. And then the other side of the thing also, I think to keep this interview in some level of understanding is that I feel like this interview was filmed a while ago, mostly because of his hair. I feel like he's got way more hair now. So I feel like maybe this interview was filmed prior to what happened at the Spurs game where he decided to walk off the pitch. I think that was prior to that because if this happened after that Spurs game, that's when Ronaldo looks insane. Because after the Spurs game where he walked off the pitch because he didn't, he wasn't coming on soon enough or he felt like he was being disrespected or whatever it may be. And then obviously United ended up finding him. He ended up apologizing to the club. He ended up being out of the team, I think, for two weeks and kind of got fined in that way and then everyone kind of moved on. It felt like, and he obviously apologized, it felt like we were back to some level of hard harmony things were kind of back to some level of normality so i don't think he filmed this after when that happened i don't think he filmed whenever he said sorry i think this happened way before that whole storming of the pitch thing in my opinion but obviously the drop of it before the world cup is expertly done 
by Piers Morgan and maybe Ronaldo's camp because he's not going to be at the club anymore, most likely, especially with the players going to the World Cup now and he hasn't played the last two previous games. So this was the perfect time, if ever, to drop an interview like this. So that's basically my opinion. So I see all sides. If it, if I was a club, of course, you have to, you know, and you weren't aware of the interview, which I doubt very much, then you have to let him go, just in terms of an authority thing. If you're Eric Ten Hag, you can't have a player openly saying they don't respect you because that's not going to work. Um, and... Uh, if you're one of his teammates, you're also going to be d- d- disappointed also because you felt like you were over it. You felt like the worst of it has kind of gone past. And now there is some level of kind of cohesion, um, unity and togetherness at the club. Now, don't get me wrong, the Glazers are still the main problem. Um, it would feel it, it would make a, it would make sense why players would be a little bit annoyed that he's kind of, you know, d- dis distracting from the great away win at Fulham, um, distracting from all the good work that's been done on the football side of things with the coaches and the manager and whatnot. That I completely understand. But for me, being an ardent Glazer out person and being somebody who truly believes in his soul, unless we get the Glazers out, we are never, ever going to become a successful club. We're never going to win the Champions League. We're never going to win the Premier League, which are two of the main trophies that I think most United fans would want. I think the other FA Cup and League Cup can happen. They're cup competitions. But I think competitions like the Champions League and the Premier League don't get run by clubs that run the way we are. It just doesn't happen. We're just too disjointed, too much of a joke for that to happen. So until we get rid of the Glazers, until the Glazers sell the, the United and give it to some new owners who actually care about winning trophies, who care about glory, who care about, you know, um, restarting and reflipping, igniting this dynasty, we're never going to be successful. So Ronaldo's interview, if it's going to do anything, it's going to disrupt and it's going to embarrass the Glazers and the owners and the operators in terms of the border and what they do. And for me, that's a job well done. As a player, he can he can come and go. I'm not really that, that bothered about him in general. If he was able to be a good squad player and help us when we needed help, that would be great. But clearly, Ronaldo only cares about himself and only wants to play every game. So if that's not going to happen at United, let him go somewhere else. But if this means this is one of the many things in the in the kind of dominoes falling of the Glazers' ownership ending, then I'm all for it. I'm legitimately all for it. I don't care who gets buried. I don't care who gets attacked, whether it's the manager, the players, the staff in the flipping kitchen. Bury them all if that means the Glazers will eventually end up selling because of the embarrassment that this um, interview is causing them and obviously how it's going to maybe affect the stock prices or the share prices. I'm definitely for it. I don't care. I'm definitely for it. So let's read some of the excerpts. It says, um, people should listen to the truth. I feel like I've, I feel like I was betrayed. I feel like some people didn't want me here, not just this year, but the past years. Uh, it says, it's following again. Cristiano on, on Rooney. Cristiano says, I don't know why he criticizes me so much. Probably because he's finished his career and I'm still playing at the top level. The Rooney thing and other things make sense. There may be some passer there from training that we don't really know about. That's kind of a behind the scenes locker room kind of talk. And I think Ronaldo's or Rooney's criticism of Ronaldo don't get me wrong, was a bit weird, but he's just a media pundit person. I don't necessarily think it's that big of a deal, to be honest, but he's allowed to have a, a, a chip back for what Rooney said to him, so I don't really have a problem with that. The comments on Eric Ten Hag, Ronaldo says, I don't have any respect for him because he, does, he doesn't show any respect for me. If you don't have respect for me, I will never have any for you. And I repeat, I don't have any respect for him because he doesn't show respect for me. If you don't have any respect for me, I will never have any respect for you which is a crazy thing to say about your manager, especially somebody who, for the most part, in public, we've never heard him disparage Ronaldo. Now, don't get me wrong. Eric Ten Hag doesn't strike me as a manager or as a coach who will ever come out publicly and say anything about any player. At the moment, we've got Mourinho basically has excommunicated a Roma defender. I think his name is like Karsdorp or something because allegedly the accusation is that this player was on his mobile phone on the bench and you know most coaches most managers don't let you do that you're not even allowed to bring out your phone on the pitch you're meant to leave it in the locker room so the fact that he was on his phone sitting on the bench is completely out of order and then I guess after the fact his attitude wasn't right he maybe made a mistake in the game he wasn't concentrating whatever it may be Ronaldo deemed him to be the worst and basically chewed him out in front of all the flipping players and said he's never going to play for him ever again blah 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 and then in a press conference he said without naming him that there's one player in this team who isn't pulling his weight and is clearly a bad influence and is somebody who I've already told to find a new club in January. So so Romino would chew you out in, in, in private, but you also give the press a sanitized kind of like PG version of what he said to you in the change room. But 
But Eric Ten Hag doesn't strike me as that person at all. He would just keep everything in the change room. So I think if he had a problem with Ronaldo, he just wouldn't speak about him. But the fact that he does speak about him and he's so glowingly in his praise and saying that he's going to be a player that I want to use in my squad. But he always mentioned he's part of the group. He doesn't mention that he's like the main guy. I want him to be a part of the group. I want him to contribute, blah, blah, blah. I don't think there is an issue on his side of things. I just think it's just a thing of he doesn't rate Ronaldo or doesn't think he's going to contribute as much footballing wise, as much as Ronaldo thinks he's going to contribute. That's where the where it comes to. And maybe there might be some instances I'd imagine where, you know, Ericsson Hag being a somewhat of a novice manager may feel a little bit awkward coming up to Ronaldo and telling him he's not playing or whatever. Just some communication things might go on. You know, him being Dutch and I think he's like Dutch on the on the border. If I'm not mistaken, isn't Ericsson Hag got Dutch on the border of Germany or something? So he's got the proper mix of like that sternness and matter of factness, right? There is no um, niceties or pleasantries in his language. He says what he says and he means what he says. So I can imagine communication wise with Ronaldo's ego them not being that cool and not that friendly I can get it but I don't think it's anything sinister from um, Eric Ten Hag's point of view or something to be like oh I'm not respectful of you I don't think so but that's just my opinion another one on Ralph Ragnick our previous interim coach who was meant to be the football director or something along those kind of lines and then you know the Glazers as they always do they pull the rug underneath from our feet as United fans and promptly fired him when he started to talk too much of the press and guess who else said something about Ralph Ragnick in the press? Rio Ferdinand, that absolute shill for the Glazers, came out and told Ralph Ragnick to never talk about. No, he told him he should keep all United business behind the scenes and not talk about it in public and all this nonsense. And then Ralph Ragnick obviously eventually ended up getting fired. But I think my opinion on Ralph is that the club set him up to fail. They never really laid out what his responsibilities are, what he was made, meant to do in terms of after his interim role. He was never really given any real authority to really change things for the better. And then I think because of that lack of, um, that lack of, what would you call it? That lack of authority that was placed in him by the owners, I think it seeped through to the players and everyone else around the club who smelled that he was a dead man walking, basically. Um, anyway, Ronaldo and Ragnick, if you're not um, even a manager, how are you going to be the boss of Man United? I've never even heard of him. And clearly, Ronaldo and Ragnick had their issues also. So that makes complete sense. I'm not that bothered on that one. Another one says, since Ags since Ferguson left, I've seen no evolution of the club. Nothing has changed. And this is a very damning and important statement to put out there because I feel like for the longest time, I've always said that I feel like we have some of the most embarrassing and maybe, yeah, we have definitely the most embarrassing group of ex-pros that's ever existed especially in top fight football considering how perilous we are in a position in terms of ownership and the fact that we haven't been successful for a very very long time and the fact that all these other clubs around us in the league are pulling away from us the likes of Newcastle have got new investors in and they're looking like they've got their act together they look like they've got a good squad there they've got a decent manager and they're doing things in a slow and calculated way and they're taking their time and they're showing signs that they could also become a force in the Premier League I feel like it's imperative and it's flipping vital that people speak out more about how horrible the Glazers are and how terribly run we are as a club and the fact that they have basically left us in a state of disrepute they've literally um you know took they've literally kind of purposely it feels like in some respects taken their foot off the pedal and left us in the place where whoever does end up buying us has a real job on their hands turning us around so much damage has been done over the years and for me personal just looking at it for just a point you know a normal guy's point of view the Glazers have no incentive to sell especially if they're you know withdrawing dividends from the club all the time and we essentially are never going to get relegated right for the most part the lowest we're going to probably finish is maybe a 10th in some season but we're pretty much solidified in that regard and we've got the clout and the history of our badge to help us get certain players over the line we can offer them high wages all this stuff can happen so they've essentially got an investment that's never ever going to not yield any sort of results or any sort of 
monetary um, gain for them. I understand. Cool. No problem. But the only way we're going to get them out of the club, to force them out of the club, is if there's pressure being put on them with protests, with walkouts, and by ex-pros speaking out publicly because that's going to affect, guess what, the share price. But they don't want to do that because these ex-pros are all in the pockets of the Glazers because they get boxes, they get box seats to sit there. Um, they might get cars to take them to the ground. They get access to talk to term players in terms of interviews. They've got their media company. Rio Ferdinand being a good example. Gary Neville being a good example he works for Sky but even though he said some disparaging stuff about Glazers but still in general there is a real lack of players ex-pros um, you know sometimes even senior members of the team who are willing to come out and say anything critical about the owners it doesn't I know it doesn't make sense for senior members of the team I get it but the ex-pros who used to play for especially the ones who were with us when we were successful under Sir Alex Ferguson they should be the ones who are really kind of trying to sign the alarm like what's going on with this great club that I once played for but they don't do it so the fact that Cristiano Ronaldo is doing it, I know he's only doing it in a very selfish way because this is only to benefit him. This is similar to the Kanye West stuff where he talks and talks about, you know, ownership and about, you know, black people not being slaves and all this kind of stuff and questioning the narrative and asking or whatever and not being silenced. But it's not because he wants to advance humanity or he wants to basically propel black voices forward. It's because he wants whatever he wants. It's a selfish thing. Same with Cristiano Ronaldo. But I think if this selfish act ends up benefiting us as a club, I'm for it. He said, Christian Ronaldo, the fans should know the truth. I want the best for the club. This is why I came to Man United. But you have some things inside the club that don't help reach the top level as City, Liverpool and even now Arsenal. He, Silas Ferguson, knows better than anybody that the club is not on the path that they deserve to be. He knows. Everyone knows. The club who don't see that is because they don't want to see it. They are blind. He's calling the owners of the club blind. Mama Mia. So... Obviously, if you're a proper football club, you can't have anybody putting your name into disrepute, right? This is basically grounds for immediate termination in some respects. But because Ronaldo is who he is, football contracts being what they are, the money he makes for the club, the fact that the Glazers are, you know, inadequate in terms of what they do as a job, he probably will end up staying. It wouldn't surprise me if after the World Cup he ends up staying. Don't be surprised in that happening whatsoever. Um, but these are really damning statements but also it's refreshing to hear because we all thought the same thing we all feel the same thing we all feel the same thing we all know it's true it continues here um i love my united i love the fans they're always on my side but if they want to do it different they have to change many many things i love the fact that they're always on my side yeah they have made probably to a fault we've got you got stands in it ah, i love that he's quoting picasso so that's hilarious he says, as picasso said you have to destroy it to rebuild it and if they start with me for me it's not a problem so he's clearly trying to be this is ronaldo's this is what it's how you know he's a pure narcissist because he's trying in his way in his own way to be somewhat humble and have a level of humility by basically saying hey if I'm the sacrificial lamb, if I'm the person they need to start the rebuild from and they finally now, because it's kind of like a backhanded compliment, a backhanded, it's kind of like a backhanded compliment in a way because he's essentially saying, oh, they finally woken up with me. Now I'm the big problem. I'm the big bad um, distractor and the bad disruptor of the club or whatnot when they've got these other issues that existed before I came. But if I have to be the sacrificial lamb, I'll take it if that means United being good again, which is hilarious because, you know, you know it's all he's full of shit he continues Wayne Rooney I'm not going to say that I'm looking better than him which is true which is hilarious I'm sure there's most more to it in a quote but that's flipping hilarious I'm sure Rooney will take it well though he seems to be somebody that kind of can laugh at himself okay so I don't think he's gonna take this too seriously um because I think he's the first person to say that he's you know he definitely not he definitely doesn't look in his best shape um another one says a club of this size should be at the top but this is not the case there is no excuses I agree with him on there it says, yeah, fans for me are everything. This is why I give this interview because I think it's the right time to speak my mind. No, he's giving this interview because he wants to leave the club. That's why he's giving the interview. He doesn't want to stay at a club like United. That Because that's the thing. Let's put ourselves in Ronaldo's shoes. He thinks he's better than a club. We may not think he's good. We may think he's you know his legs are gone we may think father time has caught up with him we may think he's not the player he once was but Ronaldo thinks he is so that's fine that's what he thinks in his head so if he's walking into that club and seeing Martial who's constantly injured seeing Rashford who's not a striker there and then seeing himself and then seeing he's on the bench I understand why he's pissed I get it especially for a club like United like how can you not play me given how crap you guys are I understand it but considering we've got a new coach who has a new fresh outlook on how he wants the team to be lined up and how he wants to attack how he wants to build 
if he deems him to be surplus to requirements, I'm inclined to trust the coach because from the evidence I've seen so far, he seems to have a kind of a clue on what he's doing. And if we need to go somewhere, we need to basically get behind the coach of the club as opposed to the individual players. But the issue at hand that makes it a bit tricky with United is that we're owned by such inept people who have done such damage to our club for so long and they, they seem to be, um, they seem to, care they seem to not care at all about the damage they inflict about how much hurt they cause by how terribly they run the club and they seem to not listen to us either it's sometimes a good thing when you hear people say what they're saying even if it means it's going to maybe um you know it's maybe going to make things worse at the club or in terms of the harmony it's going to affect how we play it might be affected our final position i mean as a fan it's a weird position to be in because at one point you want the players to speak out but then you also don't want them to fuck up the harmony in the dressing room and he's definitely going to fuck up the harmony just especially if he stays it continues Ronaldo says so Alex ferguson said to me it's impossible for you to come to manchester city and i said okay boss there are some people on united twitter who are like I can't believe he would even say that or basically admit that he was considering going to Man City. And, you know, the rumours were true of what we heard, that he was going to Man City and then last minute dot com or the flipping Glazer Acolytes, the Rogue, the not Rogan, the Rio Ferdinand's, the Gary Neville's, um, maybe the Roy Keane's, Circus Ferguson, they put a call in and they told him not to go to City and to come to United. But if we're being objective again, he should have probably gone to City. City is a made-up team in terms of the profile, in terms of the setup, in terms of the manager, in terms of what they're doing. It's made for him. He could have gone there, slotted in, become a backup for Haaland or maybe played alongside Haaland. Or maybe they wouldn't have signed Haaland now. Maybe they would have waited until summer to sign Haaland. Regardless, he would have went there and scored tappings and easily got himself into double figures by now. Easily with league goals. So he probably should have selfishly went to Man City. As a fan, would I have been disappointed? Of course, because I love Ronaldo. He's a legend of the club. But as a player that's 37 years old, coming to a club like United at the level that we're at, considering how far back we are and how long we have to go on our journey, it just doesn't make any sense he probably did set himself up for failure so it's probably his own fault he didn't do the due diligence enough to look at where we were as a club where we were as a team where we were as a flipping you know organization to figure out if we're the best place to go but then he chose his heart over his head and this is where yeah sometimes you make decisions in life you deliver them and it is what it is another one Cristiano says nothing has changed since I left the pool the jacuzzi even the gym even some technology even the chefs who I appreciate lovely people I thought they would see some technology some infrastructure I saw things I saw when I was 20 21 23 which is true because just look at the just look at the the minutia of this point because if you think about it, sports, te sports technology, sports education, um, it, it evolves all the time. There's always a few new things happening from tactics to nutrition to fitness to health. So it must be surprising to him, for, considering that he's been at these big clubs that he's been at, you know, the Real Madrid, the Juventus of this like. And maybe every season, maybe every six months, there's somebody new coming in to help out the... I don't know, with the flipping menus and the flipping staff kitchen, whatever it may be, the player's kitchen. There's somebody helping out um, every six months that comes in and says, maybe jacuzzis are good. Someone else comes in, jacuzzis are bad. Someone else comes and says, cold baths are good. Um, cold baths are bad. Like There's always some development and evolution and questioning of the narrative, of the norm that happens in football to give yourself what? That extra inch. Because that extra inch um, is, is maybe things that are going to separate you from being you know, knocked out in the group stages to maybe getting through the not getting through to the knockout stages those fine margins and they could be anything in the organizational side of football so if you're an elder and you come back to a club like united and you're seeing legitimately the same facilities number one and the same people manning those facilities facilities sorry it could be quite disorientating like what the hell is going on here like are you guys serious about actually being a big club or is this some, some joke jobs for the boys thing and obviously we know it's probably the latter I continue. Ronaldo uh, no. um, says Ronaldo accuses a lack of empathy, especially when his three month old daughter was hospitalized in July. He did not return on time for preseason because he wanted to stay with her. Ronaldo says senior executives at United even doubted him when they explained when he explained why he couldn't return, which made him feel hurt and bad. So this I agree. If if it did happen, this is something that I can agree with would kind of irk you, especially if you already don't rate the club. You already think the club is run like a joke thing, and then they're trying to 
rush you to come to pre-season because not because they want you to play and get fit and help the club they rush you to pre-season in Southeast Asia because they want to extract value out of you because they know you're the big draw they know all the, all the fans there from all the main United fans in Southeast Asia want to see Ronaldo they want to get pictures they want to get stuff signed you're going to do appearances on local television like all this stuff it's a lot of money generated from Ronaldo appearing at your pre-season so clearly that was a big issue but given what happened to Ronaldo's because um, I think this is the do- this is the baby that's that was a twin. Given what happened to the other do- the, the other twin who unfortunately passed away really premature, it's you'd be inclined to believe him. I know some people wouldn't want to believe him because maybe he you know he was already angling for a move away at that time. Who knows? But I think that's pretty abhorrent if true. You should be inclined to believe um, a player like that who already went through something quite traumatic with another one of their babies and they're going through something like this. You should give them as much space and time as possible, especially if you want to get something like that on your side also. It just doesn't make any sort of sense. So that is clearly something that I could believe that could happen. I could believe it. But I could also understand if some people feel like Ronaldo's using that whole thing as an o- option, as a w- as a reason to weaponize, to we- yeah, using that okay, that kind of interest or that kind of stuff around his kids, weaponizing it so he can basically get out of the club because that's that's pretty egregious if that happened. Do you know what I mean, most people would understand if you decided to just like throw it toys out of prime and refuse to play. Cristiano said he wants to focus on the World Cup and win it for Portugal and then come back and resolve things with United. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think you're coming back, bro. But I could, you know what? I could see him coming back. He said that Cristiano and Anfield support after the loss of his child. He said, I didn't expect to see this. Cristiano was disillusioned with, to find that Man United could no longer sign World Cup's best players, making their chance of winning top trophies much harder. Force on the universe. So, yeah. So, clearly, Ronaldo is not happy with the structure of the club. I personally feel like it's a good thing if it means the Glazers end up selling. I don't necessarily care because I honestly think the damage the Glazers have done will be will be flipping analyzed document you know, it will be analyzed and talked about for decades and decades to come honestly i don't think we actually have a full understanding and a scope of just how much damage they've inflicted on this club let alone the fan base let alone how we perceived in the around the world in football let alone all the players we've missed like there's so much stuff that's gone on around them that it's probably going to be crazy and jaw-dropping when we finally get the details of what actually used to go on behind the scenes and the fact that we have legends in our club that know this and keep quiet because they, they want to make sure they get their prawn sandwich i have no respect for them so the gary nevilles the rio ferdinand's the roy kings of this world who run interference for the flipping owners I hate you hate them all hate them all with a passion so if Ronaldo's self um self-absorbed delusional um entitled point of view leads to the Glazers leaving he's done the greatest work if on his way out he decided to put the two fingers up and they leave bueno I'm a good fan of it the one thing that's interesting about this interview though just to end is that he is a consummate narcissist though isn't it Ronaldo not once in that whole entire interview from what we've seen so far in that one little section has he acknowledged that he's not the player he once was which is crazy because in my opinion i still think despite his numbers of goals he scored at Real Madrid, and despite how he single-handedly pulled juventus kicking and screaming to flipping scudettos and stuff i still think ronaldo's best the best version of ronaldo was at united that ronaldo that had no position that could play through the middle, on the wings, um, inverted forward, all that stuff. Like that was the, for me the best version of him. He scored everything: goals outside the box, inside the box, headers, overhead kicks, long range free kicks, whatever. He was absolutely phenomenal to watch. So dangerous, so aggressive, um, so driven. And then obviously, you know, father time catches up with all of us, and he can't do the things he used to do before. But to, for him to not even say once in that entire interview, yeah, I understand what the manager wants. Maybe I'm not the player I once was, but this, but that, but this is pretty crazy. It's pretty insane that he doesn't have any idea, any perception, any introspection on how badly, on how bad he's been playing lately or how ineffective he is in general and sometimes the reality of it is that even though we played horrible for the first half against Fulham as a team we're a lot more cohesive when he's not playing it's it's not it's not it's not like an offense to say that it's a fact your eyes don't lie to you he can still score goals for sure he's probably the best finisher at the club there's no doubt about it no one's kind of denying that but when it comes to playing football 
the guy is hopeless when it comes to playing with that team. It just doesn't work. But there's probably too many missing pieces and stuff. It just doesn't make any sense. So the fact that he didn't admit any of that just goes to show that he is a consummate top tier narcissist, which obviously makes sense also because you can't be the best player in the world and be that self-absorbed and be showing your abs all the time and be doing all that stuff and not have a little bit of a delusion when it comes to how you're perceived and not see the errors of your ways at all. It doesn't really happen that way. So I can understand it. But again, if the Glazers leave because of this interview, I'm all for it. If they don't even leave for this interview, I'm all for it either because it still puts some egg on their faces and makes them somewhat embarrassed. And I love that because they, they don't hold themselves accountable enough and they basically, you know, inoc um, inoculate themselves from any criticism. They never talk to any of the flipping fans. Um, and it's just so horrible. So I can't wait until they leave. And if Ronaldo is the flipping catalyst for it, then so be it. Moving on, moving on, moving on. What I think I was going to say. Oh, yeah, cool. Let's just talk about this. So, have you guys seen all this stuff happening with Twitter? It's pretty wild, isn't it? Right. And the reason why I think it's pretty wild obviously, you got this first story about this fake Eli Lilly Twitter account, which claims um, insulin was free, which then led to a stock to fall 4.37 percent, which then led to you know Eli, <laughs> Eli Lilly, sorry, coming out and categorically denying that insulin would be for free. All this kind of stuff has happened. It's like a, it's kind of like an example of law of unintended consequences. Um, Elon sets up this idea or has this idea in his head that he wants to make um, verifications. Um, what what do you call it? He wants to make verifications democratic in some way is that democratic or the right way option not a white word to say but i don't know i don't know what the word is maybe egalitarian doesn't know what the right word is but there's a word for it but essentially elon musk wants to make verifications for all the thing he doesn't like the idea of verifications being a status symbol and it kind of denoting that somebody is of a higher creed or a lower creed if they've got a flipping sort of verify thickness name which i definitely agree especially on twitter especially with some of these journalists they literally walk around as if they own the place because they've got a blue tick next to their name as if everything they say is complete fact or as if they're any smarter than you or I, which is nonsense. So the fact that he wanted to um, make it available to all for eight dollars, which is was amazing, but he didn't anticipate all the trolls going out and making accounts of legitimate businesses with a tick next to their name and really causing a lot of flipping hassle right and really kind of you know flipping the script and making things really difficult in terms of him running the company with all the other stuff he has to do so clearly this was something that wasn't necessarily something they kind of saw happening i like the apology from no i like the clarification sorry from eli um lily they didn't actually say in the entire thing that insulin wouldn't be free and they didn't actually even say the word insulin. They just said, we apologize to those who have been served misleading messages from a fake Lily account. Our official account is LilyPad. So they didn't even acknowledge the free insulin thing. They just tweeted that, which is absolutely incredible. Really, really good way of kind of, a po no, it's a good way of clarifying without actually clarifying. I love that. Um, and then of course you've got um, this obviously says so you know the fake uh, affected their stocks which is pretty crazy um, we go here it says um, courtesy of Mashable um, we, this is a fake tweet it says we're excited to announce that insulin is now free and that had published by a blue verification check and using Musk's new verification blue subscription option they kind of since lost its blue check mark and gone private over the course of a few hours the insulin producer saw a 4.5 percent drop in his stock and had to issue a clarification on his official twitter account at lily pad in a single moment um in a week of blue check mark induced stress what began with an innocuous in impersonation of sports figures quickly descended into a free-for-all of impersonation and misinformation the practice isn't new for the social media app but more like a blue check enhanced riff on a now it's the long established Twitter joke form. One which she's users trying to get their account and username to look as close to the real thing with just a blue check standing as misinformation way and it didn't work always. But even then, the democratization of the blue tick um is ex is exasperating twitter's misinformation problem which is something i probably didn't think was probably would happen eli Lilly and company was just one target of several corporate government imposters including fake accounts for defense manufacturer lockheed market Lo lockheed martin sorry oil company bp and produce distributor chiquita absolutely incredible so big up everybody that trolled these big companies and got them to shake in their pants a job well done but it's just incredible to see how difficult it is in real time to run a company, especially one like Twitter, especially one that's kind of like 
probably got his own issues beforehand that didn't really that weren't maybe spoken about too much but the fact that Elon's coming in and somebody that a lot of people at Twitter probably ideologically and politically don't agree with or don't like in general as a person is definitely going to show us in real time just how difficult it is to make these things work when you don't have people on your side on a political basis which is crazy to think about it in business isn't it it's crazy to think in business you need to be politically aligned with your staff members um uh, with the people that use your app in order to kind of service them properly it's very strange because you would imagine if you were a real killer sniper of a businessman but you happen to be a conservative and you bought twitter you should be able to run it the way you deem the way you deem fit maybe your political you know leanings would impact certain things but overall your ability to run a business shouldn't be you know dependent on who you vote if you vote red or blue it doesn't necessarily matter but in america or maybe the world in general um, staff members the public overall who use your app um, the critics the media they definitely put a whole lot of stick a lot of, you know a lot of stake in it and clearly a lot of them are not a fan of Elon and they are doing everything in their power to ex you know emphasize and and you know and basically highlight all the things that he's doing wrong and then of course the stuff inside the company isn't isn't helping either all the leaks that are coming out to the press also are not going to help things but you know him himself isn't helping things either he put out a tweet recently where he said oh twitter is accounting for a major part of the web traffic or some nonsense like that and then a twitter bot that they have basically clarified under his tweet that that wasn't true which obviously is super embarrassing and he had to delete it but didn't offer a clarification so clearly he's not helping himself in this matter but it's quite interesting to see in real time how difficult it is to actually run these what would you call them these kind of woke companies basically that's what twitter is right these type of woke companies if you're not if you don't necessarily care about all that stuff it's quite hard to run them objectively um with some eye on maybe making it fair or whatever it's just difficult i just seen it in real time it's really interesting to see it kind of play out and then of course we've got the update here courtesy of ali sorry um, al jazeera it says musk halts the twitter coveted blue tick as imposters run amok so now you can't get a blue tick even if you want it um that's going to be put on hold for the time being because obviously people took advantage of it and messed up the entire thing for everybody else so you have to kind of wait to see what things they put in place in terms of security um checks to make sure people can't go around impersonating Lockheed Martin and affecting their stock price or whatever else that flipping insulin company was and what happened to them so it's clearly an issue that's kind of driving it and of course we've got an article here from Twitter from New York Times that's clearly enjoying what's happening here with Elon Musk saying a verifiable mess Twitter uh, users create havoc by impersonating brands and it probably will go from bad to worse really you know until it gets better but I'll be curious to see how it works and it will be a victory for him if he ends up with making it work honestly if he ends up kind of figuring out how to make this um thing function and make it make money in terms of twitter whether it's a subscription whether it's other things he should get a big round of applause because he's running into a lot of interference um he's running into a lot of obstacles he's having to you know convince people that don't like him to give him a chance the media already on his back like it's very very difficult in real time and maybe in general also another point to make he might just not be that good of a flipping business guy that's another thing also you're seeing in real time like to be an actual operator like a business owner to be a boss to be someone that can do things because i think these sort of things are similar to people that go around and buy struggling companies and then try and fix them and make them profitable and then try and flip them again that's not a skill that all entrepreneurs have or all businessmen have i think that's something that you either have it or you don't or you have a you know you have a aptitude for it i'd imagine so maybe you know starting up a starting up a company like SpaceX from scratch or from Tesla from scratch is one thing but going into an already established company like a Twitter and trying to make that work with all its you know social and political leanings is not as easy as people would think it would be and let's also put this into you know into the record he didn't buy Twitter he was forced to buy it right he kind of put a bid in kind of trolley kind of not um, he didn't like what he saw when he did a due diligence or maybe got cold feet, tried to pull out of it and the courts forced him to go through with the deal. So this is probably something that he never wanted in the first place after, you know, maybe sobering up and now he's got it and it's, it's, it sounds like it's an absolute mess basically and it probably won't get any better until he really 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 gets his feet under the table but how long will that take will they survive by then will they have enough cash flow to sustain it we don't know man we don't know because even i read the other day about the whole issue they're having with them um, working from home stuff a lot of people are saying that 
that essentially is illegal because some of the people that started there had in their contract that they could work from home. It's like a, it's like something they're basically entitled to as part of their contract. So there is, Elon basically has no leg to stand on legally to force them to all work from the office because he said in his thing, you know, you're not allowed to work from home if it's not, what's that thing called? No, you're, allowed to, you're only allowed to work from home if there's, an, if there's a valid exception can you work from home but for the most part if you have means to get to the office you have to get to the office but if you worked under twitter for a while and you've always been a work from home person as a, as a remote worker then you, you know you're not going to stand for it and he's already having to you know butt his head up against that which is a big issue so i can't imagine how he's going to deal with it but let's i'm eager to watch it from afar i really am moving on i wanted to quickly touch upon this this is a little article that um was spread on daily mail and it's i think an extract taken from the emirata podcast where julia fox sat down with her and spoke about obviously kanye because you know there's nothing else you want to speak about julia fox about really to be honest even though she's probably way more interesting than what she lets on but i think my just overall kind of like you know snapshot theory on it would be when you're a legit artist and you see how hard and difficult it is to make a living being a legit artist and then you become um, the object of some men's eye and you get attention that way and then you also then transition and become the brief girlfriend post Kim as well. Think about it. He was to think Julia was the first girlfriend on paper post Kim. It can be quite um, addictive that attention you're getting and also it's it's, it's 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 some level of success you see more success being the style icon um you know ex-girlfriend of kanye west than you ever did being a legit artist or being a legit actress or an actor you saw it you've seen the evidence so i can understand why she's doubling down super hard right which is why we're getting a million and one looks of her walking down the street in those god-awful outfits we're hearing her do those you know tiktoks where she's trying to impart her wisdom to like Gen Z kids and whatnot. And we're seeing her just going around town. And I think I read an article recently that she's releasing a book coming out that's going to be called Masterpiece or something. So clearly all of that kind of stuff that came from the back of the Kanye relationship has been pretty advantageous. It's kind of led to her to be quite successful outside of acting. Now, does she want to be an actor in a conventional sense? I don't really know. From what I've seen of her, she's you know more around the fashion people and the art people and the culture people than you ever see her really with that, the film movie industry type people. Who knows? She could be auditioning on the side. Who knows? Um, she does have a young child, so that might make auditioning hard. She lives in New York. Maybe all the auditions happen in LA. I don't really know. But, I thought this title of this article and what she said was really insane because I always kind of saw her as being somebody that was quite um, self-aware, but this is really lacking in self-awareness or is immensely delusional. But it says as follows. I went from a pervy Italian girl to a skinny and sickly. Julia Fox says Kanye West fling had a negative effect on her movie career and left her typecast. The fact that she's saying that in the same line, like skinny to sickly, with a pervy Italian girl to skinny to sickly, it kind of makes, I know it's probably not the case because the context of the of the whole podcast has been eradicated by just taking out that one sentence, but it kind of sounds like she's saying that going out with Kanye made a developer's eating disorder or something or made her lose weight. Like, what? I don't know. Let's read the whole article. It says, Julia Fox says her brief romance with Kanye West impacted her acting career for the worst. The 32-year-old actress, she's only 32 holy moly she looks way older way way older than me and she's 32 if you told me she was in her 40s i'd believe you wow speaking on a high low emrata podcast with emily radikowski monday said she realized things had changed in the wake of her high profile romance with west 45 early this year the only thing that to give her a bit of a blight because i remember seeing her when i used to be obsessed with like you know the the New York brands and Aaron Bondaroff and all those kind of guys and whatnot and all that art scene out there. There's this blog I used to read all the time. I think it was called like New York Art City or New York something. There's all these exhibitions that you check out. But anyway, I was I was obsessed with that sort of stuff, that kind of Lower East Side art scene and whatnot. So I kind of was, was familiar with her face. I never knew her name, but I was familiar with her face. So 
if if she was from that scene that she lived a life like she was partying she probably did loads of drugs she probably stayed out a lot and maybe i'd assume now with the kid and living a healthy lifestyle she lives because clearly she's ripped as well i'd imagine she probably gave up a lot of that stuff and is probably sober so being sober now and having done all the drugs beforehand that's what probably catches up on you so that probably might account for why she looks so you know so old considering that she's so young it says as follows after the big relationship i definitely noticed a shift in the acting way not in a good way as fox said um who attended the cfda awards on monday i'm not getting many offers as i was before weirdly there's been a lot of weird drawbacks with reaching that level of notoriety but you can't blame that on kanye though that's insane and also this sentence is odd because she's saying that she's not getting offers from what i understand even the great actors out there, even the ones that you, you think are awesome, awesome, they still audition. If you want the the more interesting projects and whatnot, you don't get offered those all the time. Most of the things that you do day by day as a working actor to pay the bills and whatnot usually come from auditions. You just do them, you get them out of the way and you keep it moving. Maybe some will come for offers, but for the most part, everyone auditions. So the fact that this lady thinks that she shouldn't audition and she'll be getting more offers through her way is a, more offers come her way is a little bit odd and maybe if you're a casting director or something you might think you might not think to offer her a role because you might not think she'd work for it i think that's the whole reason why auditions work right because you want to get a certain type of person at your audition if you're a casting a, to a movie or your director or whatnot if you're there but then there's always an option that somebody's going to turn up that might be completely outside of what you're looking for but they might offer you a fresh spin on what you're trying to look for or they might give you an idea for some other actor that or some other role you want to get filled so the process of auditioning and i know it's embarrassing i know it probably hurts and it takes a lot of time especially i've done a small amount of extra work and i know that you know you spend a lot of time just sitting around waiting it can be really nine numbingly boring but in order to get those roles, you just have to audition as much as possible. It's just part of the gig. It just is what it is. The fun part of actually going and acting on, on set, doing scenes, maybe going to premieres if you like that kind of stuff, hanging out with your other actor colleagues is fun, but the majority of your time is spent auditioning, is spent waiting for an answer, is spent waiting in a trailer, is spent, you know, maybe set, maybe getting greenlit, then getting cancelled before it's gone, got on air. It's a pretty brutal career, but you have to put yourself forward for it. So the fact that she's sitting there waiting for offers is odd. And also saying that reaching this level of notoriety has its drawbacks. Well, duh. You're with the most famous guy on earth, probably, when it comes to Kanye. And he's very um, controversial also. It's one thing being famous, like BTS famous, Harry Styles famous, where people just see you and like, oh, there's that guy, right? Super famous. Oh, wow, people are running after him. But to be famous where you court controversy, where you really elicit feelings, that's something you realize a lot with Kanye. He really can elicit a feeling from you. He can make you viscerally angry, frustrated. And like, the Kanye's have the same effect too. I think that's that level of celebrity that's really high where you can make people feel an emotion and you know if you didn't know that before getting with him that's probably on you it continues fox i did that before dating west she was very she was really typecasted as a pervy italian girl and now i'm just like a skinny and look sickly and it's like i don't know so she kind of admitting that her drastic weight loss might have affected her way of getting roles or is she blaming Kanye first I don't understand this she's got there's this a, there's a lot of people that do this sort of like where you speak and you say two things at the same time without actually saying anything at the same time but I don't know let's continue on it says here yeah, you see her looking ripped as well and in good shape and whatnot but it could, it could make sense why if you looked one way and you're super voluptuous and now suddenly you're another way why it might affect your ability to get roles because you might have auditioned for the role looking one way then suddenly six months down the line you've lost a bunch of weight which is good for you but it's not maybe going to help your ability to get roles it's unfortunate but what can you do it continues. The Milan Ital Italian born beauty added that she felt that portion of the people in entertainment business think she might be a liability and tabloid type person. <sighs> Fox appeared with Adam Sandler in 2019 Cut Uncut Gem said that she was un undeterred by temporary setbacks and just had to trust the process. She said Fox who appeared in last year's Steven Spielberg movie uh, No Sudden Move added it's fine I'm so busy I think things come to you at the right time so that's why I'm not really stressing I really don't care no you do care that's why this comes from okay this is probably where you're getting it from so she's definitely having a little bit of a panic and maybe is seeing the end 
of this where she's not getting any younger she's not looking any younger um she clearly loves acting more so than maybe doing the fashion styling type of thing and those roles are already drying up and already you know as um as an industry entertainment industry and acting industry in general doesn't necessarily favor or give women the advantage or the ability to work well into their old age right there's there's maybe a small handful of women who are working actors now you know in their 50s plus usually if you're a woman and you're that kind of age you don't necessarily get deals on tv you don't get to star in movies you just have to do maybe do local plays and theater and all that kind of stuff but if you're a julia fox and you want more and you want to go and do big movies and you want to be on network tv shows maybe you're realizing now that the time that you spent frolicking around and stuff has maybe hampered your career maybe being in a relationship with somebody like Kanye West may have affected a little bit of it as well but even though I think it gave her more good than bad then maybe that's why the panic is setting in but to say that to sit to say that you're waiting for offers is weird because you should be auditioning regardless and to also say that Kanye was bad for you is strange because I legitimately think he was a good thing I still think the relationship was basically built on what most guys saw in Julia when they first saw her was that, oh my God, this is white girl with an amazing body. She's got a big bum. That's the first thing most guys saw and kind of got, you know, um, uh, kind of started kind of being obsessed with her. And I'm pretty sure that's what Kanye saw. I think Kanye one day must have watched Uncut Gems and then suddenly reached out to somebody and said, hey, do you know who Julia Fox is? I want to get to know her. And then they hung out. You figured, you know, and then she's a legit artist anyway. She's a legit person from the scene. So they speak the same language and clearly it worked. But I think that's where it happened and that's where it started from and that's what happened, basically, from that point of view. So, I don't know, man. I don't know. I think this is delusional to say the least that Kanye was a bad, was a bad influence on her life and stuff. Come on, man. Would she have, got, would she have, would she have gone to Diesel without him? Let's be real. Would she have gone to Diesel without the guy? Let's be real. Come on. Come on. It continues. Fox subsequently revealed her relationship with West interview in magazine. Um, an insider on E! told us in January about a relationship between Wes and Fox. He truly loved her energy and passionate personality and knew she would be a perfect person to bounce ideas off of. He thinks she was refreshing energy and that having a lot of fun. Kanye is working on creative, something creative and Julia is definitely his latest muse. The couple dated until mid-February with Fox telling the car in February 14th that things were much more amplified for her during her time dating the rapper. Um... So it says here, I've never been operating at that level of that yay is. I've never wanted to be super mega famous. It's a life ender um, for some celebrities. They become reclusive, paranoid and hide. I refuse to not to not live authentically. The mum of one, she shares with son Valentina, 22 months with her ex-husband Peter Artimev, spoke about the short-lived romance with Wes in a chat with ES Magazine in September, saying that she would have definitely stuck it out and been there for longer prior to having a son. It just seems like he had a lot of work, to, a lot, he had a lot to work on and I just don't have the time for it or energy. I don't have the bandwidth or emotional capacity for it. I'm proud of myself for that. That's an okay statement. That makes complete sense, especially seeing and hearing what Kanye said recently. I can imagine he's a nightmare to deal with as a flipping boyfriend i can imagine absolute nightmare but to suggest that he wasn't more good than bad for you is absolutely insane if you're a julia fox because no one cared for this lady before that relationship let's be honest and she's kind of unlucky also because if i'm not mistaken uncut gyms came out around the pandemic time so she had no time to promote herself no time to bask in the glory of it because she was literally the standout star of uncut gems because no one really knew who she was and suddenly he was this voluptuous curvy white girl with a bum running down the street and acting amazing everyone wanted to know who she was and you could obviously use that lust and that kind of sexual appeal to kind of get you to the next level everyone's done it. it's not a bad thing um and she's i still think a decent actor but the pandemic kind of fucked her because she couldn't move around and do things because the world was basically closed and then on back of that maybe would she have the son around the same time if it's 22 months maybe it was around the same time also so things happen in life right the, the, the breaking up with the son's dad the son happening um you can't promote your movie that you're in because of a worldwide pandemic it kind of threw up all these things happening in terms of her career i don't know where she was going in terms of career before she met kanye even so yeah but to say that he was more bad than good is legitimately insane but regardless big up julia fox hope she figures it out regardless hope she figures it out next okay we're going to touch upon this because this is something that's just been released recently and even though even though i'm not gonna you know i'm, ne I'm never gonna buy it i just thought it was interesting to kind of touch upon because i think it must feel pretty cool as a creative if you're tremaine and you are the owner of denim tears it must feel pretty amazing 
to suddenly be the guy who has essentially created his own kind of um he's created his own sort of bat he's gonna yeah he's gonna he's gonna, wait, why'd you say this uh, uh, this might yeah it must feel amazing to be tremaine the owner of Denim Tears, and be the person who single-handedly created the new sort of like barrier for entry or like the new kind of like industry standard or the it garment of the season or of the, you know, many, many seasons to come in terms of what he's done with these um, jeans that he has with these flipping reef motif all over it. It must be pretty cool that he's done this. Like he's taken a classic Levi's and elevated them to the point where now if you're walking down the streets with these reefs around them, everyone's going to think you're, you get it, that you're the guy, that you know exactly who I want. And I think that's pretty, pretty amazing given how, you know, basic and ubiquitous denim jeans are that he's been able to take such a standard um almost overlooked item and elevate it to the way it's been elevated it to and for the most part if you look at some of the jeans that he does they're sometimes in washes or they're sometimes just the basic kind of indigo blue or like the whites and stuff but very rarely are they like capital-esque jump jeans i know these ones we've got on the screen are a collaboration done with sawarski which is emphatically called bust down tears which i flipping love the name of it i'm not gonna lie and the jeans are 1200 the jacket is 1250 it's a type 2 jacket too which might be the best um levi's denim jacket in terms of a shape um especially with the boxy fit and where the pockets sit and the little slit pocket i think that happens on the side i think or one of the pockets as well there's good inside pockets too but the fit of it's just a amazing and like i said you know for the most part you've got like a light wash jean color here you've got an indigo or you've got a black color sometimes yeah you've got black you've got indigo blue like regular selvage denim colorway and that's basically it nothing else and i think that's a really important part that kind of separates what he does with other brands because with a brand like capital you're getting all these patches on it you're getting it sort of re-engineered you're getting re you get you know you know you're getting um panels added onto it you're getting all these accoutrements all this sort of stuff maybe even stuff like a visu is the same sort of vibe and i can't think of any other jeans that people wear at the moment but you know what i mean there's always these bells and whistles that might make you think oh that's why it's worth eight grand but when you just essentially make, you know, before these Swarovskis, they're usually, I think, screen printed, if I'm not mistaken. I think it's a screen print. So over time, it will chip away if you're wearing them every single day. It will peel. So your bot got basic box standard Levi's 501s with a screen printed reef design on them, which you would imagine would make you... You'd imagine that design might alienate the white audience, right? Because of the connotations around it and the history around the reef and cotton picking and whatnot. You imagine if you're white, you'll find it hard to wear it, but still people wear it anyway because it's just such so much of a clout symbol and icon sort of thing. And like I said before, I just think it's impressive because it's just basic jeans and he's kind of added this logo that's more than a logo. It speaks to something. It kind of helps people connect maybe to him personally, maybe it helps them give them free bits of clout makes them feel cooler um i don't know whatever it may be i just like it i like it i like it i like it it's a really really cool thing that he's done with these and for the most part they sell out like hotcakes the funny thing is now that i've seen the sawarski jeans for 1200 suddenly now my eyes see 295 and think that's cheap interesting how that happens isn't it that might explain why some designers like to start off very high in their price and position their things next to balenciaga next to Bottega veneta next to Givenchy and all that stuff because eventually when you then end up starting to sell stuff at a lower price point it's going to sell like hot cakes because people are going to attribute you with oh you're the brand that sells 900 pound tees or 500 dollar tees so now if you do a tee that's 40 bucks they're going to fly because they associate the brand value with that 400 and not that 950 or 30 whatever it may be that might be the smart way to do it but yeah I, I still think the jeans are pretty sick i know i was pretty much on the fence with them but i think the more i keep seeing people put out jeans with bells and whistles and zips and studs and stuff on them all over them and all the sort of 
of unnecessary gobbledygook or that kind of like LA style SoundCloud rapper gene with all the straps and all the unnecessary nonsense. Having the ability to put out consistently quality light wash jeans with this little um, reef motif around them is for me something that looks pretty cool. And it kind of reminds me of the golden era of flipping APC when they used to put out really cool jeans that people used to like wearing, you know, every single season. I think they even had a a program where you could send in old jeans that you never bought anymore or you never wore anymore and they could basically get them redone and then resold again to people so that was a pretty cool system that they had in place also there but i like them i'm not going to lie personally for me i'm not a fan of wearing the one i have to wear them as a suit but that's just me in general when it comes to light wash jeans i'm a big fan of wearing the whole flipping denim suit giving a jacket also and let me wear that shit head to toe um, with a pair of white air force ones or a crisp white t-shirt proper trapper style right are you a trapper um are you just some guy that works for a crappy startup are you some guy that works in a supermarket are you some bus boy are you a bartender no one knows but you put on a light wash denim suit with some white air force ones and a white tee like look at that in the white jacket look, look how good that looks that type that type so to be honest it's a type 2 jacket that really sells it i think you could put any logo on that any print and it'll look good but that type 2 jacket is just amazing the look of it um like i said i think it's got a pocket on the side on one of them the pockets on the side here are quite nice the chest pocket how they where they sit are nice i think i think if i'm not mistaken the leave the visvim 101 denim jacket that's a real kind of grail for most people that are into that kind of thing is based on the type 2 i'm pretty sure because the shape and the construction is a bit similar but obviously you know um what's his name hiroki um from flipping visvim added his little spice and numbers on it and did these little bits and bobs but yeah destroy have done some uh, be sure so i've done some good collabs of collab with Givenchy and denim tears now so clearly they're doing well so yeah so a bit in conclusion Big up Tremaine for creating a new industry standard in terms of jeans, making them the most covetable jeans on the scene right now, even to the point where people are buying out and selling out $1,200 jeans with Swarovski crystals emblazoned all over them, which I absolutely love and I've got a lot of time for. The whites are still in stock, it looks like. The blues are not. And it comes with this little badge as well that's flipping crisp. That's amazing. Certified crystals from Swarovski since 1895. So big up him he's getting to the bag he's getting to the bag moving on from that we have to talk about this have you seen this this is pretty cool isn't it this is for me anyway because i think this is a win for all of us china factory mandems out there all the rep factory um enthusiasts like myself um all the this what's, what, what's that what's the, what's the subs called designer rep subs and fashion rep subs and all this stuff all those guys that you know are on those reps sub subreddits and are on discord discussing the um discussing qcs and wanting to get gls on certain things that you've copped that have just dropped at the flipping fulfillment centers or the well, fulfillment centers, the places where they pick and pack your stuff i forgot what they called this is going to be a huge win for us and rep sneakers gang this is courtesy of nice kicks it says stockx removes claims that sneakers are authentic you hear that stockx has removed claims that their sneakers are authentic and as you can see here from the picture if you're not watching i'll describe it to you there's two sneakers here side by side that are the what they call the mum and pop i forgot the name of it what they actually called them but there's an actual name for them oh that's it lost and found jordan's um chicago ones and most of you would know they're very covetable they're very desirable and you know everyone kind of wants them and they're meant to be the litmus test in terms of where the resale market is at the moment but bloody blah, blah 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 there's an example of how they'd be listed on StockX, and usually underneath the listing of what the product is and the style or whatnot there'll be a condition tab there and um, there'll be little buttons sorry like condition or whatever it may be and before it'll be verified authentic which meant you sent the shoes to StockX, and they have their verifiers check the shoes and ascertain whether or not the shoe is authentic by whatever test they have whether they have a legit pair they can compare it to whether there's telltale signs on rep pairs that can show them why it's fake in terms of maybe the toe box bending up the swoosh being too small or too big loads of little tails i can tell and that could obviously help them to verify them but now off of the back of i think partly the success in quality no basically the quality 
the improved quality overall of rep sneakers and obviously this ongoing court case that StockX has with Nike it looks like they're deciding to acquiesce and say we can't guarantee or confirm um, that all the shoes sold on here are flipping authentic we just cannot legality wise and also it's not a way to protect themselves in terms of people putting in fake claims and shit but I think in general this is a win for reps in my opinion but this could be just a Nike thing let's read through the article in the midst of an ongoing legal battle with Nike StockX has removed the claims from their product page that identify sneakers as authentic the resale giant was called out by Nike early this year on their unreliable authentic authentic authentication process. Nike alleged that StockX 99.95 authentication accuracy rate is a baseless claim and the swoosh even purchased four fake pairs from the consignment platform to prove it. <laughs> and the funny thing is, is that for the longest time, I think what StockX really did in terms of a PR, they were able to put it out there that they catch most fakes. And I think they scared a lot of people off by maybe doing some high profile claims cases, whatever it may be called. But what it sounds like to me, especially at the height of the pandemic, loads of people were unemployed, loads of people were out of jobs or out unemployed, loads of people were just at home, not doing anything. And some people basically jumped on reselling as a way to kind of make some extra money, right? Where people are doing drop shipping and selling stuff on flipping Amazon and whatnot. Other people decided to get into sneakers, especially at the time there were so many shoes coming out, right? The pandemic happened around the world, but the sneaker releases did not stop. So I think during that time, there was a real uptick in the amount of shoes that were being sent into stock to be authenticated, whether it's from people who were, you know, looking for extra money and had a collection that they weren't going to wear, especially with a year or two spent in lockdown or living in some level of restriction for the pandemic, or it was people making money because they needed to feed their family. They probably saw an uptick in the amount of shoes coming through and they couldn't authenticate everything. It's just Took, it took just took too much time so over time they probably put their foot off the pedal you know took their eye off it and they let a lot of things through they probably wouldn't have before or the other theory is that they just sold it sold a good you know sold a good game in terms of them being able to authenticate things and catch things made that pr spin but the reality of it was every single day people were making bucket loads of cash selling reps on StockX because the thing that people don't understand about replica game is that for the most part there is a there is different sort of factions of the replica community. There's replica community of people out there who just want to buy really limited edition shoes at the cheapest price possible. So they want to buy a pair of bread Jordan 4s, but they don't ever want to pay close to retail on it, which is what, maybe £180 or something crazy like that. So instead, they'll go to a replica Chinese factory and pay let's say $30, $50, whatever it may be for that shoe. Now, clearly the quality of it isn't going to be great. They may look a bit dodgy. The jump man may, you know, may, may look a bit R-worded, but they've got the shoe that they want because they just want the style. They don't care about the authenticity level of it. But there's another side of, um, of sneaker replica community where they want to have the legit shoe. So they want to have the limited edition shoe but they never have the ability to maybe get successful purchasing it the authentic way. So they'd much rather buy it through the rep factories, which is where I kind of lie. I always, every single release, try to enter sneakers. The last time I won something from sneakers, ironically enough, was the off-white Jordan 1s. The Chicago ones from the 10-pack. That's the last time I won anything from Nike sneakers app. I don't win anything ever. So anything that I purchase has to be either resell has to be either second hand on eBay or has to be something from a rep factory. That's the only way I can get hold of stuff. So I'm probably the other part of the replica sneaker community where I'll only buy it if I cannot buy the, 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 the real thing, quote unquote. And I think because of that, increase of general average everyday people like myself who weren't necessarily big rep fans from before and maybe would have looked down on rep community that's probably seen the uptick in the amount of people buying it and uptick in the amount of people deciding hey you know what there's actually a, a, another thing is also in replica community there's a really high high tier i forgot the name of what they list them as but there's basically a tier that you can purchase jordans for basically the same retail price that you would if you're buying them from nike but they're fake but they're really good and you can't tell that they're fake so people will probably were exploiting that and taking those shoes and flipping them onto StockX and making easy money, hand over fist. And maybe even now it's probably maybe increased the amount of people doing that flip because you could easily take a replica shoe from China that's been bought, that's the, of the highest level and sell them on StockX and make some easy money if you wanted to do so. It's not that difficult to do so. It really, really isn't. So it continues. Since the company's inception, StockX has claimed 100% authentic sneakers on enticing customer service policy. Um, sorry, an enticing customer service policy that allowed the marketplace to grow 
growth popularity. The authenticity claim changes can already be seen in coveted releases like the up and coming Jordan 1 Lost and Found. Early this year, the sneaker was listed as verified authentic and condition new. Now the sneaker has removed the authentication claim and is only condition new, which is flipping wild. It doesn't help that these two pictures you know the one that says verified authentic looks fake and the one that says condition new looks real but i'm sure it's just the fact that somebody's got like a real pair in their hands and this is probably a product image or something from nike i don't really know um verified authentic 2020 august 27 2022 and no mention of it on november 2022 there the changes have also been carried out over stockx's uh help section and it says that describes how their process works. The StockX stating that we verify when you, you we, yeah, we ver. No, let me start that again. Change the StockX help section. The changes um, have also carried over to StockX's page that describes how their process works. With StockX stating that we verify and when we verify, it is shipped to you rather than claiming authentic. Um, however, the verification process to buy his page still claims um, StockX as an authentication center. The page also states the exact nature of the verification process carries an item, varies by item, which slightly tip toes around the marketplace previous authentication promise. I wonder if this might be something to do with the recent layoffs, because I know some people got laid off at StockX. I wonder if they've laid off a huge chunk of their authentication team because they don't need them anymore. I wonder if that's a thing. I wonder. Um, it continues here, of course, we've got the spotting it out. It says, um, while this might not, might seem like a major, sorry, minor adjustment, Oh, sorry, it says here, while this might seem like a minor adjustment, these small changes could offer big benefits to StockX as the Nike litigation alleges they can't prove authenticity. By changing their claims on authentic to verify, StockX legal team may also be able to create a semantic loophole that creates a great area for StockX to not only be able to um, to not be liable for their inaccurate authentication process. Nice case will continue to update the case as it develops. For more information on Nike sneaker news, follow Nice Kicks. Crazy. Oh, they've responded with an official statement. Um, they said here, StockX's official statement is as follows. Our comprehensive approach remains unchanged. While product authenticity remains core to our analysis, our verification process is better reflection of our broader value proposition that we provide customers by review all products sold on StockX. Ah, <laughs> oh, Jesus. Look, we look at the range of indicators before sending a product onto the buyer. There are a number of reasons why a product may fail to meet our elevated standard of excellence, including incorrect size, Size, missing accessories or damaged box, a manufactured defect, or if it shows signs of previous wear. Since our inception, StockX of Education has reviewed more than 35 million products and we continue to invest in new technologies to use alongside human inspection and refine our process um, to best serve the customer. I, I applied to work at StockX so many times um, over the years, maybe not maybe not recently, maybe like a few years ago, and it never went anywhere. And it's just funny to see those companies that are so like picky and finicky and, you know, act a bit big timey when they come to the hiring process be such a mess behind the scenes. But, you know, I'm sure there's some good people that know what they're doing there, but God almighty, man, oh, absolute horror show. So I wonder, has this either increase the amount of fakes that are now being sent because they know the flipping guards are low or is this now what they need in terms of getting things back to where they need to be in terms of maybe turning it into just what everyone else does isn't it like the depops and stuff they don't have authentication things you just list what you want to list on there i'm not really too sure or because if they do that then that might take away the need for them to have stock in it because the reason why stock exists is because you sent the shoes in to get verified put that badge on and you could buy authentic shoes but if they don't have that then why not just have people send the shoes directly from their own homes in it but i do like the uniformity of the pictures as well the products i think that's a really cool feature you don't really see that too often on those kind of consignment sites so yeah let's see how this develops as it continues another thing i wanted to discuss was this post that went semi-viral on a Berghain subreddit which i thought was pretty interesting in terms of a debate and a conversation piece to bring up on the podcast and it kind of was um an article it kind of was a hot take that somebody posted on the reddit that was in response to this article that's featured on RA, um, which it says as follows, unfeasible for many artists, our exclusivity clauses causing local DJs more harm than good. We spoke to Nita Aviance, sorry, Ariel Zatini, 
Ariel Zettina, um, Nix and more about how industry-wide practice impacts rising artists. And obviously the person's hot take here on Reddit was um, it would be better if the scene it would be better for the scene if Berkine would close because of its exclusivity clause, which is a crazy thing to say in the subreddit, but obviously it's going to get you loads of conversations going. And the person's remarks were as follows. As far as I know, Berkine has an exclusivity clause for DJs for two months before and after the Friday night gigs, or the, sorry, the club night gigs. Additionally, I find this problematic if you consider Berkine is mostly run by white cis dudes. There are many smaller BIPOC queer trans flinter, I don't even know what that is, DJs promoters in the city trying to make ends meet. Um, and the, uh, as well as you know, techno is not um, created by white cis dudes. So my take is this. I love Berghain, it's raves, but for smaller DJs and promoters, it would be better if it would close. Berghain's having too much power and uses it not in a nice and egotistic way, basically doing only what they can do to stay in their quasi monopolistic and power position. Furthermore, it sets a bad example towards other clubs and promoters. It would, If it would close, it would help smaller DJs and promoters. Furthermore, it would diversify the club spaces as other venues would benefit. The scene would spread again more amongst, um, what, what would spread again more amongst different places and give new peeps new chances. If you like it, discuss. So there is some level of, um, there is some truth in what this person's saying. It would be nice if this exclusivity thing was kind of eradicated. I think nowadays it doesn't really make much sense. I don't think so. Because I think maybe in the past, if there was a dearth, yeah, maybe in the past, if there was maybe a dearth of promoters or maybe the opportunity and the means to get artists to fly over to come and play in your town wasn't necessarily so readily available with cheap flights and other bits of transport or maybe if the industry or the community or the market or whatever you call it wasn't as big as it is nowadays right with people saying the nightlife economy is like in the billions in terms of how much money it kind of generates that would make a lot more sense. I guess the I guess the advantage for it, if you're the promoter, would be that if you're the person that's fronting the cost, so you're the one paying for the flights and the accommodation, that you don't get other people basically um, eating off of your plate by then just waiting for you to book the big person and then booking them after you. Because then that would mean you're paying the, you're kind of, you know, bearing the brunt of it, mostly with the cost, taking all the risk, and then they're able to kind of also, you know, extract some value from that situation by booking the person after the fact. So I get it. And I think for certain artists, especially if you're of a certain caliber, it probably makes some sense to have an exclusivity clause in your contract. Um, because then, you know, your agent also could uh, arrange to have certain relationships with certain people. But nowadays, given the options that are available, given the scale and the level of people that are available, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever to have exclusivity deals, especially if the exclusivity deals are affecting regular DJs, like no one that's like super famous and people who are just like, you know, on the come up or maybe they're like, you know, on the cusp of becoming popular, but people that clearly need to play in more places before they get to the level where you can say they're like super, super famous. And that's the issue at hand. And this article here from Stop the Wax, that was published i think a few months ago that says exclusivity contracts are holding back local music scenes really speaks on it there's a lady here who speaks on it who says the following she says berlin artist johanna nutson i think that's how you pronounce it remembers how during remembers during her first year djing in berlin one club leveraged an exclusivity clause um that forbade her to play anywhere else in the city for three months before the show with an extra week to call off afterwards she says it was super hard for me at the time as i hadn't yet started to play outside of berlin even though the gig was great it completely ruined my financial situation over the those few months since playing Playing was my only income that went on for a few years when i eventually started touring it didn't really matter anymore but now it feels absurd to think that basically i had to save money to be able to say yes to these shows so it's a double-edged problem on one side it could only really affect you if you're somebody that only plays in your own city or don't like to travel but then if you're building up your name you're probably not going to be playing in many places outside your city anyway in the first place so having an exclusivity deal in your own city is flipping insane because it's going to limit your ability to make money after the gig that you played which is pretty wild it should only affect you if you go to play in out in other places to be completely honest but going back to this article that kind of speaks on it 
in general and going back to this point this person raised around the Bergheim thing we're probably in a far better place in terms of DJs in terms of a variety and range I think if you are somebody who is ideologically possessed and cares about work things like having quotas of who plays male or female what your identifier is in terms of sexual orientation I think we're in the best time period ever for that thing because I feel like nowadays bigger clubs are more accepting of having DJs from that community of people whether you're epoc bpoc queer trans lgbtq whatever flinter is you get more chances to play now than you ever did prior in my personal opinion i think it's a, probably the best time ever for the quote-unquote alternative club spaces to really kind of um, show themselves and have the ability to attract a general audience or have the ability to put their events on in general places and not just always be confined to flipping underground warehouse spaces and stuff because especially in london we have six we have kind of sex positive parties in some of the biggest clubs in here and clearly there's an appetite for it and clearly there's a desire for it and clearly the people that run these spaces get it and they want to welcome those people into their flipping clubs it makes complete sense it's all good i love that still got a long way to go but i love it when it comes to the Bergheim being run by cis white dudes i don't necessarily think that's a problem i think personally for me um there might have been an issue prior years where there was a particular type of dj playing there um maybe they did only book maybe a certain caliber of person but i think since the pandemic um you know i feel like they've made a concentrated effort maybe it's because of you know convenience because maybe you know especially with brexit and especially with the pandemic there wasn't maybe a f easier way to get people to come over and play so they had to tap into their local scene and local community but i feel like now on any given weekend in a Berghain, you're going to get a far better representation of a diverse scene and what maybe the musical tapestry of dance music is all about by seeing who plays every weekend it's far more reflective of the scene in general it's not just basically the biggest mix mag person playing alongside a couple of people that you don't know no it's absolutely a very sort of group of people from residents to friends and family to somebody that's a local hero that are playing there on a weekly basis and it's really done well and again for the biggest club in the world to do that because they're the industry standard they're the ones everyone's following everyone copies i think they do a good job could they be doing a better job for sure but for what they are the level that they're at and what they're kind of operating at and the fact that they have to run that business essentially like a machine every week it just kind of keeps chugging along and doing the damn thing i think they're doing pretty well all things considered and then i think the other part of it to mention also is that unfortunately i'm not sure if it's just a dj thing it must be a dj thing when it comes to music i just don't think you can insert or sprinkle in some of this woke um ideologically possessed stuff into djing and into dance music industry it just doesn't work in my opinion because i think the kind of the audience sort of dictates what becomes successful that the punters always do that no matter how much the industry tries to shut people down our throats or tries to tell us this person is the next big thing we generally decide what we like and what we want and you know there's an issue here in london at the moment where some of the queer spaces some of the queer club nights some of the um gay club nights the lgbtq friendly club nights some of those people are complaining that they're getting too many straight people coming to their party think about that they're putting on parties that are so fun that are so amazing they have such a fresh outlook on dance music such a fresh approach to booking that all the straights are now coming over to their club spaces infiltrating their spaces and they're not liking it they're complaining about it that's the position that we're in now in london there is a real friction and a battle between people from that community feeling like the straights are coming in and taking over and watering down or making the, their spaces not as safe as probably they would be if it was just them that's the place we're in at the moment so clearly things have advanced in my opinion they've gone a real long way but when it comes to music and DJing and stuff in general you can't do all that identity politics stuff because I feel like if you want to be represented you just put on your own party that's all you do and I think all of the parties so far in London that are doing great the Body Hammers the Infernos the Budokais they've all just been started by people just being like you know what enough this stuff isn't representing me I'm gonna do my own thing then it kind of catches up with the normie crowd myself included and now suddenly I'm there dancing and having a good time but not knowing that these guys have been doing this for ages before I even arrived there so there's always that option there and to put on a night to you know go and DJ somewhere or put on an event is super easy it's probably the easiest thing you could ever do especially if you go to a place that's already got an inbuilt sound system it's cheap as chips especially if you get your friends to help you and play so if you do feel like you're not represented you're not represented in the dance music scene then what you do 
is that you go out there and you start your own event. Now, the other point I was going to make that I thought was really maybe a bit left field here. I think RA also played a slight role in the scene at the moment and how it is because I feel like when they had the DJ polls back in the day or when there was more of a community and you could actually leave comments on post and share information and talk to people from around the world about your love of dance music, about nightlife and all that malarkey, I feel like a lot of local people were promoted, a lot of local people were recommended or people that you maybe have never heard of who aren't local but just doing their damn thing and just kind of, you know, keeping themselves to themselves and not on social media with their hands splayed out wide trying to get all the attention. And one of the good examples of this was a RA DJ poll. That RA DJ poll back in the day was for me an opportunity to not only see who was, you know, going up or down on the list because that was always cool to check out but the major thing about it was always the comments you scroll right down to the bottom of that page and you read the comments and there'll be people arguing about oh that person has no business being number five how could my guy or my girl that i like be number 10 or whatever it may be and then sometimes there'd be active conversation around hey if you like dj tennis listen to this person hey if you're a fan of solomon listen to this girl like there'd be those kind of recommendations so then you'd find out about people who maybe you you wouldn't have known about unless you read the comments and also i think like nowadays with the scene being as varied as it is now and i think i also get the feeling there's less of an appetite for like the big ticket djs now i feel like even though there's a new crop of them coming up like the dixons and stuff are probably replacing some of the other older folks and even the likes of the guys that do kind of music they're literally like the new kind of generation of kind of superstar djs but for the most part it doesn't feel like everyone kind of wants the big glitzy name they kind of want to go to a fun party with a couple kids name but it's not all about the one one person it's all kind of spread out so i feel like now would be the best time to have a dj to have an r a dj poll because if you wanted to in the back end you could have it how i think they had it last time where it was only for events that you'd maybe clicked attending on i forgot how it worked or they'd only do it for a three-day period at the end of the year or something on those kind of lines but now if you had the tech and you had the wearable to do it you could put it into place where you could only vote on events that you actually purchased a ticket through ra events with like the ticket that they sell you know or whatever that you can set up on your thing and then they could also have a system where it would only show you the DJs that played on all those lineups. So then at the end of the year, a pop-up banner will come on the app and you'd select the DJ that you were impressive or that you felt was really cool or that you saw a lot of times and then that will get included in the poll. And then what end up happening is that you'd have a lot more because what ended up happening on every ra poll the top 10 or fi the top 50 were always the same kind of names that kind of interchanged but the others outside of that or maybe the others outside the top 20 were people that you may may or may not have heard of who have played on their local scene who a lot of people saw in that area and that who kind of voted for and that would then go on to sort of democratize things and make things a little bit more spread out and even as a conclusion i don't think exclusivity deals would end if Bergheim did close I feel like Bergheim still um, plays a role I don't think it's the only place that you should be going to and kind of being obsessed with I feel like there should be way more variety there should be way more competition for it out there but I think unfortunately because of um, various because there's not a lot of places in the world that have the attitude that Berlin seems to have or that has a relationship yeah it has the, that kind of response to nightlife the same way that berlin does it's difficult to have that place replicated in other places because some countries the uk being a good example we have a very adversarial relationship with drugs with alcohol the government doesn't like young people having fun so it's difficult to ever imagine a place like Berkham ever existing in a, in a country like england and i'm sure it happens in other countries too so maybe that's why they basically are able to do what they want take their foot off the panel if they want to or not and just kind of run the show how they feel like it because there's no real competition and there never will be any real competition that's probably the whole point of it but i still feel like for what they do and the level they're operating at they're still up there they're still the best in my opinion they're still up there still the best and if anything the mistakes that they make should serve as a cautionary tale for people that want to do their own thing it shouldn't be a thing of like oh let's get rid of them because they're making mistakes it should be oh if that club is making mistakes that's awesome what can i do in my position um to correct those mistakes what can i do to maybe not repeat those errors that i've seen what can i do to maybe do things that i've not seen them do whatever it may be i think that can happen if people be a bit more objective and not be so emotional about these kind of things in general in my opinion and also the final final point on it 
DJing is hard enough as it is. It really is difficult from what I've seen and my brief experience um, and my kind of, you know, just fandom of it in general. It's very hard to make it. It's very hard to become a professional who's suddenly paying their bills from going out and playing at flipping all these great play clubs and places and festivals and stuff. It's not easy. And no one path is the same everyone's different so then to include stipulations like you know having people play because of their race color creed or sexual orientation it just unnecessarily muddies the waters it makes it it makes an already hard occupation even harder to succeed in because now you're just what giving people a chance because they happen to be from this community or for they happen to be this race it just doesn't make any complete sense in my opinion and also it doesn't serve anybody in the long term because you want people to play at that level who are good at playing in front of people you don't want people just to be there because of what they identify it just doesn't make any sense really um because usually you can fool a customer maybe once to get them to give someone like that a chance but after that one time if they're not good they're never going to come back again so essentially you end up shooting yourself in the foot but again what do i know anyway that's the next show episode number 619 i think thanks so much for tuning in but the pleasure of your company as per usual if you enjoyed the show and you like what you heard you know what to do smash like hit subscribe leave me a comment down below and if you want to hear more from me all you got to do is click the subscribe button and that'll be greatly appreciated but until then take care be safe peace oh yeah you're gonna hear a tune today if you listen to the audio podcast if you listen to the video there'll be no tune it'll just be, be waving by